This conference will now be recorded. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to day three of week nine of YPPE Fest. I am Richard Campbell and for a change you can see me. I'm a committee member of YPPE and a senior integrity engineer for Rosen Group coming from my home office in Newcastle, um, which is surprisingly quite very warm today. Uh, I'm pleased to say that joining us today for YPPE Fest, we have Russell Treat of Enesis and the Pipeliners podcast coming all the way from Houston, Texas, which explains to the later time for this webinar. Russell is an industry leader, software entrepreneur, podcaster and trusted subject matter expert specializing in oil and gas pipelines operations, custody transfer measurement, leak detection, automation and software. He is responsible for Enesis's operations as a provider of software and services to enable pipeline operators to comply with control room management regulations, while at the same time implementing operation best practice through SCADA. He is also responsible for GCI's operations in measurement training and standard operation procedures. For more than 25 years, Russell has been involved in the design, specification, selection, development, and delivery of products and systems for oil and gas uh, measurement and automation. Russell works closely with pipelines and producers on their selection and implementation across all mission critical systems. So, good morning, Russell. How are you? Very good. Thanks for having me. So very glad to be here. Excellent. No, it's a, it's our pleasure to have you. It's a, it's something that it's a it's kind of a new webinar, I guess, uh, different to what we've done previously. Um, so it's a, more of an, an informal chat, really, which is. It's really something that YPP would we're really trying to get more of. Um, it doesn't all have to be uh, death by PowerPoint or anything like that. It's it's something it's something a bit different. So no, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Yeah, I I, I much more enjoy a conversation than a uh, a uh, broadcast. Yeah, if you will. <laughs> no, I I know the feeling. I'm not not always comfortable being the one in front of the camera. Maybe be, maybe watching, but there we go. Well, so, normally I'm um, behind a microphone, not often in front of a camera. So uh, Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so today we'll be talking to Russell uh, to get to know his story in the industry, understand what companies he started, how that has worked, and also to talk about the very popular Pipeliners podcast, which is something that I'm very excited to talk about. So something we've talked about a lot within YPPE, Russell, is, is understanding people's backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm backgrounds in the industry and how they actually got to learn about the industry and it subsequently joined it. So I was interested to know how did you get to working in the pipeline industry? Yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting story, I think. Um, so I, I grew up in the Dallas area of Texas, which is in the northern part of Texas, and really didn't have any exposure to the energy business growing up. You know, a lot of people who I know now did, you know, they grew up in the business, their parents were in the business. That's kind of how they learned about it. Um, I went to school at Texas A&M. You can probably tell that by all the fancy <laughs> stuff on my walls here. Um, and I was a civil engineer. <clears throat> um, I was on a military scholarship because I was a poor boy and I needed a way to pay for school and um, got out. I did civil engineering in the military. I did civil engineering long enough to know that that wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, when I got out of the military, I started working in cryogenics, so liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen, liquid CO2, that sort of thing, in process applications. And um, I had always wanted to start my own business. The age of 29, I started my own business um, had that for about a year and a half, and I merged it into a group called Software Marketing. And what Software Marketing did is we would go and look for what we call the device. And now you got to realize this was early 80s, so this was before there was really even a software business. Uh, and what we would do is we'd look for a device, typically a piece of software that built by an engineering company, but not a product. So not a product meaning didn't have training, didn't have a roadmap, didn't have a strategy, didn't have customer support, didn't have documentation. It just was something that something built, had been sold to somebody, they used it, they liked it. And we would turn those things into products, you commercialize them. Uh, what I found in doing that, that I liked oil and gas best. I did, a, I did many products in many industries and a handful of different verticals in um, oil and gas. And I really liked the oil and gas business, not to mention that's where a lot of my friends work that I'd gone to school with and such. So, um, I just found an affinity for it right off the bat as I started getting exposed to it. Um, so 
in 92, I left software marketing and I took a role running the US division of a Canadian company that was building back office measurement accounting. So basically taking the measurement from the field, reviewing it, processing it, and sending it out to the general ledger for invoicing and all that kind of stuff. So worked there for about six years, facilitated the sale of that company to a group in Dallas, uh, left and I started Intersys and started as doing measurement. Measurement led to some telecoms to collect the measurement, led to doing some simple HMIs, led to doing some control rooms. And here I find myself 20 years later and I'm kind of become an expert in the measurement SCADA control room leak detection space. So always been a geek, love technology, <laughs> love software. Uh, I'm not really a coder. Um, I mean, I, I have written code many, many, many years ago in languages that pretty much don't even exist anymore. Um, but I am a software guy in that I'm fascinated by the technology. I love working with the developers and I, I love the, um, we call them energetic conversations we get into about what a coder thinks needs to be done versus what somebody who's got a customer engineer focus thinks needs to be done. Um, so that's, that's kind of my background. So I, I really had to find my path into oil and gas after I found that I had a love for oil and gas. And, yeah. You know, starting in measurement, I, I've, you know, over time I've become more and more f focused and I've really, the last 15 years in, in particular, I've done nothing but pipeline and I really love the pipeline space and I'm, I'm fascinated by it. And I'm, I'm just as curious about tech and, you know, how it's used and where it's used as I was when I started out 35 years ago. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. So it's almost a passion separate to the industry that then you then fell into the industry, I guess, and then worked on. Well, I, I wouldn't say I fell into it, Richard. I'd say I, I found it. Yeah. And then figured out a way to get, make it my home. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, when I when I first started running uh, BMP Energy Systems, which was the back office measurement software company, I'd been in the business about three months, and I was going to the trade shows and, you know, carving out the smart guys and asking them questions. And I remember coming back from one of those measurement schools and saying, I'm going to retire in this business. Just the, the people were great and the, the technology was interesting and they were doing, de doing meaningful work, you know? So I, I just fell in love with it. Said, I'm, I'm, I'm riding this one all the way out. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, absolutely. No, that's really interesting. So you, you mentioned a few different companies there. So how many companies have you actually started and worked with in, in the industry? I've started nine businesses. Um, I currently am operating three of them. So, uh, and, and all of the businesses I've ever started, started with nothing more than an idea. I mean, I, you know, I didn't have somebody come to me and say, Hey, I got this idea. Can you help me? They, they all started with an idea. Um, and all of them, uh, have involved technology in one way or another. Um, well, maybe not the first one, but you know, from early on, they've all involved technology. So um, I, I'll talk a little bit, bit about Intersys. So when I left um, BNP Energy Systems, which was in 98, um, I started Intersys and I kind of like, I started out of my house, you know, where I, I was, the time I was living in a little two bedroom apartment and I, I started it in my second bedroom. And um, Really, all I did was get on the phone and call people who I knew and asked them if they needed help with something I knew something about. And I got busy within a couple of weeks and, you know, just kept doing that. That's still what I do, you know. And fortunately, I've got a team now that makes those calls. I don't have to do all that. But, um, you know, that's how it started. And, you know, I just go someplace where I found an interesting technical problem I felt like I could solve. and you know, find somebody that would pay me some money to help them solve it. And, you know, that, that kind of evolved. Um, Intersys started out as an, a measurement consultancy and, and now it's a full on software company. In 2012, um, when there was a new rule that came out in the U.S. called the Control Room Management Rule, um, we pivoted from being a services company to being a software company and really focusing on control room management. Control room management kind of led us into the whole realm of pipeline safety and regulatory compliance. And we're growing through that food chain now. 
So yeah. that, that's kind of the story. And then um, gas certification, which is the other major company I operate, is a training company. They do measurement, um, primarily focusing on the training that field technicians need to deal with the measurement equipment in the field, uh, select it, build it, install it, operate it, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that came out of the fact that I just love measurement because that's where I started. And I had an opportunity to buy a training facility that had been built by United Gas Pipeline and had a live gas pipeline loop at it. And I just couldn't pass the opportunity. I said, that's a cool facility. I'm going to build it, buy it. And then we're going to figure out how to put a business around it. So wow. that's how GCI got started. Oh, excellent. No, that, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Good to hear. So all these different areas. So you've got the software side, you turn from a service side, but you're working with a lot of the um, like the regulations over in, in the US. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From my experience, they're all very strict, those regulations. So do you, at least rel it's very prescriptive. Um, and so what's your experience with working from that side, from like the control room side? And well, it, it's really interesting. Um, I had gotten to a point in 2010, 2011, where I really wasn't having any fun in, in the business. I wasn't, I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. And when we started doing the control room stuff and I started getting, you know, I started going and in, in the, the U S pretty much all pipeline regulation comes out of some kind of incident. So an incident occurs, uh, what's called the, in the U S the national transportation safety board, which does all the, accident investigations for pipelines and railroad and aircraft and so forth. Um, they'll do a, an investigation, publish a report, and make recommendations, and then Congress will take action around that. So most of the regulatory framework comes out of incidents. And when I started seeing line of sight from these are the root causes that contributed to these incidents, and I saw the contribution of the control room, all of a sudden I got fired up again. And I'm like, we got to, there's so much we could do with technology in the pipeline space that we're not doing. We're way behind other industries. We're slow to adopt technology. And there's some valid reasons for that from a safety and a change management perspective. But I, I got excited about it again. Um, you said that the regulations in the U.S. are prescriptive. They're really not. They're mostly proscriptive. They tell you what the outcomes are, but they don't tell you how to get there. So... Mm -hmm. What, what we saw was an opportunity to do what we know about technology and do what we know about operations and work to achieve something which we call natural compliance. So natural compliance would be, I do my job and all of the paperwork necessary to demonstrate compliance just occurs in the background by the system. And then when the auditors come back around, I use the management tools to access that data to demonstrate my compliance. So we have we have focused initially on the control room because space we know intimately and uh, built a set of products called Control Room Management Suite. And they did address things like scheduling and fatigue management and alarm management and shift handover and all these things that are covered in the regs. And we have tools to do it all. And they all conform to policies and procedures so that you can demonstrate compliance, trying to make the control room more efficient and not burden them by the record keeping. Mm -hmm. So oh, that makes a lot of sense. And the, and the, cha you know, the, the challenges in most of the regulations, while they're quite technical, they don't tell you exactly what to do. They just tell you the outcome you're trying to get to. So trying to do that efficiently is the challenge. Every operator's got something in place to do it, but doing it efficiently, that's the challenge. Yeah. And that's the uh, opportunity for guys like us. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So there's a few different companies that you've started, as you say, there's nine in total. So the the effort that's put in to start these companies up, um, what does it what does it take to actually get these companies going? Well, that's actually a oh man. Yeah. Do you want a five minute answer answer or a five day answer? Because I could probably give you both. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try. The, I'll try the shorter answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think. I think primarily, Richard, the thing that's interesting about that question is the way I would answer it now is very different than the way I would answer have answered it when I started. You, know, you got to think when I was when I started, I was 29 when I started my first business, and I was an engineer, 
and I thought like an engineer and, you know, I, my whole mindset is, well, you come up with an idea and just build it, and make it happen. And business doesn't really work that way. Business is more like surfing or sailing. You know, you do all your preparation, but once you cast the lines off or paddle out into the waves, you're at the mercy of the environment. Um, I think that what I have learned is a good idea, well executed, will get adopted by people that trust you. So there's a certain amount of effort you have to expend to develop trust. And you know, trust is not just about honesty, it's also about competency. Can you actually do that, right? Um, and in particularly in technology, that trust is pretty high because there's a lot of ambiguity around software, particularly if it's something that you're working to improve and perfect and not a lot of people are using it yet. Um, so it's really about building strong relationships, you know, of tr based in a, a solid trust. I mean, they know you, they know your competencies. They, you know, they know when you say what you say, you mean what you say, and you will, you will do what you need to, to, you know, live in your word. And then it's just about really trying to get deep into the problem and solve it. I mean, it's, it sounds easy, but it, it takes, it always takes way more time and human beings are, and particularly in our space, they're very resistant to change. Mm -hmm. So it's just, a, and, and change, you know, you got to just get them there an increment at a time. So I, what I would say is that lots of good ideas out there. There's lots of good attempts. What really makes the difference is the people that can build trust between themselves and their customers. And, you know, our, one of the wonderful things about our business, if you do a good job for one guy, they'll tell somebody else. That happens about a hundred times slower than if you do something bad, but that's exactly. how that works, right? Yeah. So, you know, and, and the other thing that's kind of interesting about software is it doesn't, re you don't have to go buy a bunch of stuff. I don't have to go buy trucks and factory and welders and, you know, gear. I, I need to write code. So the cost of startup is all your time. It's not about outlaying a lot of cash. So that, that, create some opportunity but there's you know there's a lot more software companies that fail than make it yeah i can imagine definitely mm -hmm. so something i wanted to get onto which is something that you've started and i think it was three years ago almost uh, is the pipelines podcast oh this is a great story so <laughs> <laughs> i actually like telling this story um You've asked about other things I started, and you know, I didn't really start Pipeliners Podcast out to be a business, although it's kind of become that. Um, it, so I, I was, one of the unique things about our business as we were shifting from services to software is that we were very well known and well thought of, but in a small kind of sub-community within our space. And, and I wanted a way to get more well known more broadly across the pipeline space but i didn't want that to be a marketing thing i didn't want it to be overt uh, and i spent a lot of time thinking about it and i i started listening to podcasts a pretty early adopter of that tend to be early adopters of of new tech anyways just because i want to know you know where the wind's blowing what, what's coming and where we headed um and i was noodling with the idea and i got this idea of pipeliners podcast just because the name had a ring to it and then I thought, I kept thinking about it and listening to podcasts. And I started listening to podcasts about doing podcasts. I did that for a couple of years. And then I made the decision I was actually going to do it. And then I spent about another nine months figuring out how I was going to do it and what I was going to do. Because I, I'd come to a couple of conclusions that one, if I was going to do it, I needed to do it for at least a year before I had any knowledge at all about was it having any impact or you know, doing any good. That was number one. Number two is I wanted to do something that even if I just did it for a year and never did it again, I'd capture something that would be of value to the industry. And more broadly than what I do, I wanted to really address the entirety of pipelining. And part of that is I wanted to learn. So as I was thinking about, you know, there's different kinds of podcasts. There's news, you know, kind of current events. Uh, there's guys that do storytelling. Um, and then there's interview shows. And it, what occurred to me is I learned the business by talking to other people. You know, when I was 20 or 29 years old, 30 years old, 35 years old, I, you know, 
I was pretty much every week on the phone talking to somebody, asking a question, learning something. So I thought, well, why don't I do that again, but capture it and then other people can learn too. So that's kind of how it came up. So I started this in November of 2017. I did about four episodes. I got about 25 episodes planned you know, kind of going through my network and the people I knew and, and subjects I thought would be interesting and then started expanding outside what I know. And of all the things I've ever done, this one is just running away from me. It, it's, it's, it's fascinating how quickly it's traveling all over the industry. I, I've had people reach out to me from all over the world and I have met people and talked to people that I would have never met and talked to if I hadn't started doing this podcast. So it was, it's been a real gift, a real blessing. I've had a ton of fun with it and I'm learning all the time. And I'm, you know, one of my gifts is I'm hot, very curious. I'm not afraid to ask stupid questions. So, <laughs> so that tends to work. If you've listened to it, you'll, you'll get what I'm talking about. So, yeah, so it's, it's been a, it's been a real really fascinating journey and now i'm i'm having to i've actually had to build a little bit of a team around it to keep up with it so that that's been yeah. interesting too. excellent no it's, it's great to hear it it's something i'm really interested in because it, it matches exactly with what we're trying to do at ypp where it's the whole knowledge transfer and it's it's mm -hmm. broadening your knowledge of the industry it's companies are very good at training you understandably to do your job that you paid for but they don't then give you that access to the wider industry, which you have to almost do that yourself to be able to do that. And I think the podcast brings that together perfectly. Yeah. Thanks for that feedback. Cause that really is the goal is to capture those content, capture those conversations that matter. And I'm, I'm really pleased by a couple of the episodes um, for the guys in uh, Europe. You not may not be aware, but um, there was an incident in the U S called Bellingham. And it's, it's kind of a capstone event in the history of pipeline safety uh, in the last 50 years. And I, through some of the things I do uh, in regulatory work, uh, got to know a gentleman by the name of Larry Shelton. And Larry was an operations executive that had direct personal experience with uh, the Bellingham and the families that were impacted by Bellingham. And he, sh it took me a year and a half, but I got him to share his story. And it's so compelling because it makes an emotional connection to the importance of what we do as pipeliners, mm -hmm. particularly for those guys that are working in pipeline integrity and, you know, responsible for the safety around the assets. It, it really makes a, an emotional connection. And I think one of the things I wanted to do is communicate the passion people have for the things they're doing, even though they're pretty technical and pretty geeky and the importance of them. So, you know, that's been really rewarding. And I know that a lot of that's occurred. Uh, I've had people come to me and say, Hey, I listened to that podcast. I'm so glad I listened to it because I never used to know why we did that. Now I know. And, and then, you know, the, the other thing I would say too, about the podcast, just in general, or the pipeline world in general is we tend to be kind of siloed, you know, so the pipeline integrity guys don't really talk to and know what the, you know, the regulatory guys are doing and don't really talk to or know what the measurement guys are doing. And, but we all kind of want to know the business holistically. Mm -hmm. So the vision was I'm going to capture information so everybody can learn the business and I'm going to try and keep it technical so that it'd be engaging for engineers. Absolutely. And it, it does that exactly. I think that's something you touched on on the um, the crack management um, podcast that um, you, mm -hmm. you released a few weeks ago, um, where a lot of their experiences from, I think his surname was Stackhouse. I can't remember his first name. Michael Stackhouse. Yeah, Michael he's Stackhouse, the um, yeah. kind of the lead guy. Um, he's an industry guy. He's worked all over, but he's the lead guy at PRCI on the on their crack program. Yeah. So then he was saying that a lot of what they were finding was they would implement changes to make, but then because the different areas within one company weren't talking to each other, it was very hard to be able to do that. You're not, they haven't got that communication and they haven't got the awareness of what different roles are doing. And, but yeah, so to hear that the podcast is actually helping with that is a, a new level to it as well. So no, that's uh that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. And that's, again, that's really the goal, you know, is to, is to try and help people understand, you know, when I, what, what impact 
am I having on others that I might not know? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we start, I mean, really, I did a, I did an episode with uh, Skip Elliott. Skip Elliott is the presidential appointee in charge of the FEMSA, which is the pipeline safety agency in the U S and he talked about the need to, you know, we are about 99.997 safety record in the U S but we really ought to be 99.999. And to get those other two nines, we was talking about what's required. And one of the things required is we, we're going to have to work more effectively as teams across the entire company. And that's, that's a huge challenge, a really huge challenge, just given the size and scale of things. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, that's uh, that's really interesting. And it's, Podcast is a medium as well where when you're traveling a lot or when like for me I'm walking the dog or something you just put it on and then you're just in your own yep. little world so it it fits in nicely with when you're away from the desk or anything like that it's it's it can sometimes be seen as dead time or relaxation time but that is a way to you just you can just listen yep. to something while you're on the go and then learn something most of new. us spend a lot of time behind the wheel of a car or a truck you know running around to do our work so you know it's an opportunity to to listen to something right exactly and there's plenty of episodes is it 130 just shy yeah well i'm i, I, I don't know exactly what the number is it's been released but we're right at 130 right now yeah yeah Excellent. you know what's i'll tell you what's funny about that when i started this about episode 2025 i was running out of ideas and, and mostly because I'd kind of gone through, you know, my domain of knowledge and contacts. And then I'm, you know, I'm thinking, how am I going to find these other things, what, these other things I need to talk about? And there was lots of things that I just had a notional understanding about. Um, I really, did, I mean, I knew what an ILI tool was, but I didn't have any idea how they worked. I did a whole series with a PhD engineer on ILI fundamentals and the different tools and their technologies and how those technologies work which was fascinating to me and quite detailed, um, but it's very similar to what we do in SCADA and what we do in measurement. It's just that the kind of, the, the, you know, the data electronically, what we're doing is very similar. What we're doing with the data is very different. So, yeah, so, you know, all of a sudden I would get into one domain and then that would open some other doors and that would some open some other doors and people reach out to me that, you know, have things to talk about and I'm, I'm digging it because I'm learning about all this cool technology and these disciplines from, you know, some of the sharpest people in our business. And you know, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a, quite a cool thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so just to wrap up really Russell, so what, what's next for you in the future? Um, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll let my, I'll let my inner geek shine through a little bit here, Richard, if that's okay. Um, I have a theory about uh, where we're at in the pipeline business and what it's going to take to get to a order of magnitude improvement in safety performance. Um, and that has to do with the, this idea I talked earlier about natural compliance, but not just in the control room across all of the activities that need to occur in O&M around the pipeline and then being able to do some analytics and benchmarking, not just within a company, but across the industry to determine how am I doing and should I be doing better? Um, so I, I think that there's a huge opportunity there for our industry to make a big difference. I think that the need for management systems versus technical systems to get to that order of magnitude change is enough. There's enough there to keep me interested another 10 years or so. We'll see. So I, I think we're going to see some, I'm really interested in what the, you know, what is the pipeline world going to look like 10 years from now and how, how are we going to be doing things with augmented reality and various kinds of visualization techniques to look at the impact of multiple kinds of factors affecting the pipe and how do I visualize all that and you know it, it, we're going to be in a very different place and how we do workflow and how we do workflow across the organizations I think you're going to see I think you're going to start to see um, the business shift more to a team mentality so that there's the team for every asset versus 
a department for integrity and a top department for corrosion and a department for um, damage prevention, you're going to start to see teams that are asset focused and, you know, really, really want to understand holistically everything going on about an asset. So that, that's kind of what I think the future is. And I think there's going to be some awesome opportunities for a software geek like myself to figure, you know, come up with something new and see if anybody's interested. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, you've got a proven track record, so I don't doubt it. <laughs> well, I have I have more failures than I have successes. I just choose not to talk about those. Yeah, <laughs> we all do that. <laughs> right. right, so thank, thank you very much for that, Russell. Um, do we have any questions from anyone? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself or feel free to uh, to type it in the chat box. Um, but just in the meantime, we, we've already asked Russell to come back uh, to touch on the more technical side of his commercial work with um, with Enesis and the like, so, which he's kindly agreed to do so in the future. So we'll be looking forward to uh, welcoming Russell back for that. Um, but yeah, so no, that's, uh, it's really appreciated, Russell, for taking your time in this uh, early morning for you. Well, I very much appreciate the opportunity and uh, hopefully, you know, we, we help people learn a little bit more about the business. And um, I would encourage those that are listening, you know, listen to the podcast and um, you know, drop me a note. Tell me what you think. You can do that on, find me on LinkedIn or um, there's a contact page on the podcast side. I look at all that stuff and I, I'm really eager to hear what people are thinking about what we're doing. I'm really eager to hear our recommendations for improvements and recommendations for subjects and speakers. So, you know, please reach out, let me know. Excellent. Great. So it's the Pipeliners podcast and is that, is it pipelinerspodcast.com? Yes, sir. Pipelinerspodcast.com. Yes. Excellent. Also, there's a few comments there. So you've already got a, a fan of the podcast from Brazil with Tiago. That's great to hear. Nice. Thank Thanks, you. Tiago. Very good. <laughs> so, yeah, it is traveling far and wide, certainly. Yeah, I'm always a, I'm always a little surprised that uh, when I start hearing back from the non-English speaking world, that's, you know, they're they're listening to this. That's that's uh, that's awesome. Just really awesome. Excellent. So Simon Joyce has a question. Um, he's wondering what's your view on how um, European and UK pipelines are managed. Oh wow, um, you know that's a, that's a really it's not really a question I'm qualified to answer. I can talk in detail about the U.S. and Canada um, and to a little bit, uh, you know, Central and South America, but I'm not really, other than notionally, um, what I would say is that, you know, the regulatory construct is different in, in Europe in particular. Um, you know, it's more nation state that's organized how they're going to manage the pipeline. It tends to be, um, I don't want to say more prescriptive, but I'll say more robust, probably a better way to say it. Um, you know, in the U.S., the, the regulatory framework at the national level sets a minimum standard, and then the states set the standard they think is appropriate. So oftentimes the, the states have higher standards than the government or the, the federal government. Um, so in, in Europe, it's, you know, it doesn't really work that way. It's more, this is the standard, and we think this is the appropriate practice for pipeline operations, where that is really left more to the states in the U.S. So um, I, I think probably there's more consistency, but there's a higher level of requirement because of the, of the nature of how the, you know, just how the governmental systems are put together. You know, the other thing that's interesting, too, is, other than in the U.S. and Canada, almost every other place in the world, and in fact, I think every other place in the world, the, the pipelines are actually not owned by private companies. They're owned by the state. And, and that has some bearing on how things are done. So when they're setting standards, they're not looking at minimum standards. They're looking at appropriate standards. You know, in the U.S., that's late left to the states and even to the operators themselves. So it's a different, it's a very different kind of just governmental framework. And, and that, that, that actually, when you actually run that all the way down to the ground, you know, like to the, the boots on the ground, the dudes in the ditch, um, it's not really that different. <laughs> but when you start talking about how they're organized and get their money and make their decisions, it's very different. 
Excellent. By the way, it's the it's the boots in the ditch that matter. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think oh, Simon's responded there. Thank you, Simon. Um, so I think that's everything there. So we'll wrap up there. Thank you very much, Russell, for taking the time. Um, we'll be back tomorrow at the normal time of 2 p.m. with a presentation from Stom Tom Steinvort of Rosen um, with a case study of a challenging inline inspection of an eight-inch riser in the North Sea. Uh, so please join us then. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening and joining. And uh, thanks again to Russell. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me join the conversation.